All right, we are live. Hey, everybody out there in Facebook land. This is Robin from Backscatter coming at you from the home studio. And I'm joined today by our CEO, Jim Decker, over at Backscatter HQ. How you doing over there, Jim? Pretty good, Robin. How you doing today? I'm doing all right, man. It's uh, you know, a little, little gloomy, a little drizzly, almost to the point of being rainy here in Salinas this morning. But it looks like the sun is coming out, so shaping up to be a good day. And uh, you know, honestly, it's kind of perfect weather to be posted up inside here talking about five more great underwater images and exactly how we shot them. Uh, that's what we're going to be covering today. Um, just like last week, we've picked five of our favorite shots from a pretty good lineup of current cameras, everything from full frame mirrorless and SLR down to compact. So we got some pretty cool stuff in the lineup today. Um, I just want to give a quick shout out to the Backscatter staff that are also in the chat here as this broadcast is going out. So if you have any questions, comments, you want to learn more about anything we're talking about, uh, our staff is there in the chat. So feel free to drop whatever questions or shout outs you've got into the comments section. And anybody with the Backscatter staff prefix on their comments is part of our team. They're going to be dropping some helpful links and resources out there for you. So if you need some additional stuff on the fly, they're the ones to provide it. Um, anything else you want to know or any kind of questions that require a little more explanation, drop those in there and they're going to forward those to us, which we'll answer as soon as we're done going through our five great images. We'll do kind of the, the live Q&A portion will be like the second half of this broadcast. So with that being said, uh, I'm going to kick it back over to Jim here to kind of break down where Jim is coming from as an underwater photographer and the, you know, the mindset and the mentality of what went into capturing these images. So over to you, Jim. Yeah, thanks, Robin. So, um, you know, we kind of went over this a little bit last week, but for those that weren't with us last week, I'll, I'll go over it a little bit again. Um, I have a pretty um, set way on the way that I shoot. Maybe I have some strong opinions about the way I shoot, about some of the techniques I use. And so um, might not be for everyone, but uh, I find it's the most effective for me. So for me, as a professional, I have to come home with some shots. There's a little bit more pressure on me because I can't come home like, ah, I didn't get anything on this trip. You know, sorry. Um, I have to really pull things off. So I have a methodology for the way that I shoot. Um, so one of the things is I always have an idea of how something's going to look in the frame before I go ahead and take the shot. So I, I kind of decide, you know, where the elements are going to be in the frame, where the foreground subject is going to be, what the background is going to be doing. So I'll kind of have that um, kind of dialed in when I um, when I'm about to take the picture. OK, cool, cool. Um, so tell me a little bit about your rig and how you have stuff set up as well. What's uh, what's kind of your go to equipment for capturing these? Well, I do shoot a lot of different cameras because if you look at the backscatter reviews on the website, uh, probably 90% of the shots are, are from things that I've shot from compact, mirrorless, SLR, everything in between. So pretty much um, I shoot everything. So it's like the things that I'll go over aren't going to be specific to one particular camera. Um, however, when I do have a choice of cameras, I usually take a D850 with me. Um, so this is, this is my, uh, my favorite rig to shoot uh, from Nikon, uh, Nikon D850. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's my go-to rig. All right. Looking pretty good. I'd say with that, I think we're about ready to jump into some of the images. What do you think? Sounds good. All right. Let's kick it over to our turtle friend here. This is a pretty classic shot. Uh, let me throw up some metadata on this one so we can take a look at our settings. And Jim, why don't you break down our friend, the turtle here? What went into All getting right. this shot? All right, cool. So this shot, um, this was done in, um, in Cayman Islands, in Little Cayman. And uh, the way this went down, uh, Robin, you were actually there in the water with me for this shot. This yeah, was, this was a uh, cool one. Yeah, this was at the, uh, the very last dive of the digital shootout from a few years ago. Um, and uh, I had told uh, Robin had been looking for a turtle shot for the last two weeks and hadn't gotten one. Um, so last dive, Robin points down the reef to me and there's this turtle swimming straight at us. Um, so I didn't have a ton of time to get set up for it. So I, um, 
I, uh, what I usually do, this is my, this is uh, again, talking about the technique that I do for setting up shots. What I do is I take a picture of the background first. I'm not even interested in the turtle at, at all. I take a picture of the background. Just so you're uh, ready I mean, by the time he gets to you, right? That's right. I take a picture of the background. I look at it. You know, what is it? Is it too bright, too dark? Then I make an adjustment for that. Um, then I, what I do is I'll take the strobes and I will get them into position. And, uh, and then when I get them in position, I'll point it at something like the reef. And then I'll take a shot of the reef. And uh, I'm, I'll be taking a shot of the reef about the same distance away from the, uh, the subject as I would be for the test shot for the reef. Because if you think about it, turtles are kind of colored the same color as the reef. They're designed to blend in. So I'll probably get a pretty good exposure uh, by uh, test by doing that. So then I do that. Once I have that in, then when the turtle shows up, my exposure for my ambient light and also for my uh, strobe light is pretty much all set at that point. So now it's all about focus frame and fire. So you mentioned kind of setting up the shot by, you know, by getting an equal distance away from the reef as you would the subject. How big is this subject and how close are you getting to it to pull off a shot that looks like this? Yeah, for the, for this guy, this was a fairly small turtle. Um, so in pulling off the shots, um, it's it was a little bit easier because the the smaller ones are a little bit more curious. Um, so they'll kind of hang around a little bit. But so for distance of subject for something like this, this is a close focus wide angle shot. So um, we're talking about from here to about here. So about if you do the hang loose to about a fist. That's kind of the the distance you're working with for. For the, from the dome to the turtle. Okay. And I noticed this, the settings you do have assigned here, well, you know, they, you could say they're kind of traditional wide angle jump settings. It's also mm, maybe a little, well, they're, they're a slightly unusual. Can you tell me a little bit about why you went a little wider on the aperture? Yeah. So there's a few things going on here. So, um, again, going back to my philosophy of how I set up a shot, Usually when I'm setting up a shot, I'll pick the shutter speed and the aperture for the subject. Um, and then I'll use the, so then basically the on the shutter speed side, it's like, well, how th fast is something moving? Something's moving fast, I'll use a higher shutter speed. If it's like just a reef scene, I can get away with using a slower shutter speed. And as far as the aperture, um, I'll pick that dependent upon how close I am to the subject. Now, again, you pointed this out to me, so it didn't have a lot of time to make a lot of changes. I was pretty well set up for like a more of a reef scene type shot when this turtle came along. So um, there's not a lot of time to make a whole lot of changes. So I decided to keep the, um, the ISO at the same at 200. Normally what I would do in this kind of a situation for a close focus wide angle, I would be going up to maybe uh, F11, uh, at least F11 for something like this, uh, but probably 16 or 22, because as you get closer to the subject, to the dome, your depth of field drops, even with a wide angle lens. So we want to get more depth of field so we can get the turtle head nice and sharp. The other thing is uh, with a dome is getting the corner sharp. When I was uh, actually taking this picture, I had um, a different rig and I had a larger dome on it. It was a nine and a half inch dome. This is a much smaller dome. This is like a six inch dome. The larger domes, you can run uh, um, uh, bigger apertures and not get a drop off in corner sharpness. So I decided to leave it at f/8 for that. Um, and then 1 125th, I didn't really have time to change the ISO up. Normally, I would want to shoot a little bit faster on the uh, on the shutter speed with a turtle because when the flippers come out in front, they kind of go like this, they move back and forth, and you can get some motion blur on it if the shutter speed isn't fast enough. So. When doing this, um, I made sure that the ambient light was looking right with these settings. And then when I was uh, uh, doing the strobe test, I had to bring the strobes in really tight. So um, if you kind of look at this rig here, I bring them in like really tight to the handles here. Okay. All right. So it like mashed in. And with the large dome, um, the dome was kind of in the way a little bit. So what I actually had to do to actually get the nose of the turtle is, is turn it in just a little bit uh, inwards and actually shoot through the dome slightly in order to light the turtle. And you, you um, weren't worried about I, any glare reflection, anything like that as you're shooting with the part of the, the strobe beam coming through the dome? 
No, it was just it was just slightly through the dome uh, to get the light onto the nose of the of the turtle. Because in the first shot that I took with this, it's, I was I didn't do that. And the very first shot, the nose just had this little like like right here, just a little bit of a shadow right there. So I just had to go just kick him in just a little bit so I could converge on the front nose of the turtle there. Okay. One thing you had mentioned to me too was kind of balancing the strobe light and the ambient light on the turtle and some some kind of fine details there that may, you know, they tied into those particular exposure settings. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So one thing you need to do with your strobes is to make sure that they're bright enough um, to overcome the ambient light and that the ambient light is dark enough so that the strobes can overcome it and not mix too much. Again, we didn't have a lot of time with this guy, and so you can see, like on the on the, I'm looking at the turtle right now. I'm looking at the um, the head of the turtle. You know, nice color, nice color on the flippers, but if you look on the top of the turtle head, you can see a little bit of cyan um, from the ambient light on there. And if you look at the shell, you can see a bit um, cyan from the ambient light. Ideally, you know, go back again. I get the strobes up a little bit higher. I'd make the exposure on the ambient light just maybe like a third of a stop darker to get a little bit more light from the strobes onto those areas. So it would be more of the natural color of the turtle in the shot rather than the ambient light overtaking that. Given that this was a very rapid situation in the sense that, you know, you kind of, you only had moments to spare to get your settings dialed in as much as you could to be ready for the turtle to get there, to be able to pull off a shot like this in that, you know, pretty, pretty split second action, you know, he's just coming in for a quick pass. I'd say you nailed it, you know, and that, that ambient light creeping in there, it's like, it's one of those fun details you can kind of pick apart after, but just being able to pull this shot off in that short amount of time, thanks to, you know, the presets and that, you know, that kind of, uh, that mentality and prep work, it's still, I mean, that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, you mentioned having a couple different shots where, you know, you might not have noticed that detail initially, you know, maybe could have had the strobes up a little higher, but you did reposition the strobes cause you noticed like the shadow on his nose. So when this guy's coming in for such a quick pass, how many shots did you actually have to pull off? to get this one or how much, how much of a shooting opportunity did you have to make those little quick adjustments? Um, basically the only adjustment I made to it was the, uh, the strobe positioning. Um, uh, the, the exposure was good. The, um, you know, the focus, we'll get to focus in a second when we talk about that, but the, all the exposure was pretty good after I did my test shot. Um, so I had about seven shots or so of, uh, that I was able to take of this guy before took off and, and started going down the reef again. Um, so with that, you know, it's, you know, not being able to change, uh, things like I wanted to do a, a faster shutter speed that would have helped with some of the ambient light, but the strobe light was strong enough to actually freeze the motion of the turtle in this shot. So that's why the turtle looks nice and crisp and clear. It's not from the shutter speed. It's actually from the flash freezing the motion. Awesome. All right. And be honest now, how much work did you have to do on this in Lightroom to make it look so good? How much of this was straight out of camera? How much of it was in post? Um, as far as the um, what was done in post, the, um, the, the watercolor was leaning a bit aqua. And if you've ever done a class with Erin um, or Erin and I for a Lightroom boot camp or taking one of her Lightroom classes, she, she's doing those three times a week, by the way, plug out to Erin there, um, is that... Um, is that you can take the um, move the aqua slider towards blue in huge saturation luminance and and um, and then desaturate the aqua and so the uh, the idea is like a lot of times the ambient light can come out looking a little green or a little aqua and that's what happened with this particular photo so um, I did do that adjustment to uh, to affect the blue in the background um, other than that there the the I didn't really uh, dork with the exposure um, it's it's pretty much the way it was out of camera, except for a couple, um, uh, color adjustments. Nice. Awesome. And I see one comment in the chat here from Oren Noah. Um, he mentions that having that natural kind of cyan light on there keeps it looking natural and tied into the scene. He was saying he thought if the whole thing was strobe lit, it could just look like superimposed and photoshopped on there. So, you know, two sides of the coin for sure. Um, I appreciate that feedback in the chat. Yeah. It's just for me, it's like, I get a little picky, you know, it's like when it's like, you could see like the, like the, the, the front part of the flippers are nice and, um, are nice and, uh, uh, well lit, but then you could see 
as the flippers go back towards the body, you can see the 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 cyan. That that like that bugs me a little bit, and the the cyan on top of the head bugs me a little bit. I mean, I could go in there with some uh, radial filters and and fix that. Um, you could easily do that. When you do a radial filter, you can then take the filter and uh, change um, color temperature. So I can I could blend that in and make that happen a little bit more, but I didn't do that. Um, and the shell doesn't bother me as much, you know. It's like I, I, it's yeah. You can tell when you're looking at this. It's it's um, it's a uh, lit more um, how it would be as if you were um, just shooting straight out of camera. Yeah, right on. Well, with that, I think we'll move on to our next image here. Let's see what we got. We have a pretty sharp looking stingray in a sandy cloud of action. Let's talk about this one, Jim. Uh, we've got our settings and camera info up on screen there. Looks like TG5 and an M52 wide angle lens. What do we got going on with the Stingray? Yeah, so this was uh, also in the Little Cayman, but at a different uh, different dive site than what the turtle was. And this was actually uh, last year. Um, and so this is a dive site called Mixing Bowl. And there's a, uh, a like a coral uh, tunnel kind of crevice there. And whenever I'm at that site, I always look into that um, that crevice to see if there's anything in there, because a lot of times you'll find something in there. And lo and behold, there was a stingray in there. Um, and so it does make for like having the, the crevice in the background. It does make for an interesting photo you know, with, the, with that backdrop to it. So kind of uh, swam into that crevice and crept up on the stingray. And so when you're um, when you're uh, doing stingray shots, there's like there's basically two types of shots. There's one where it's feeding. And there's one where it's resting. Um, and so this is one where it was feeding. And so when they're feeding, they're much more tolerant of divers, especially uh, ones that are a little bit larger. So you can approach them because you need to get, again, about, uh, you know, that far away, you know, about fist or so um, to the stingray to make this shot actually happen. So uh, by getting that close, you have to creep in really, really slow. And what I do is, uh, you know, get down to the same level in the sand with the, um, with the critter, and then I keep my legs um, all the way up, um, so my fins are, are are in the water column, so I'm not causing backscatter for myself. And then I I might creep in on my elbows on the sand a little bit to get in the position. And with a camera like the TG5, it's a pretty small camera, so you can get it down really low. But the thing you have to that one of the secrets to this is a lot of people don't have the camera low; they actually have the camera up higher. And then they angle downwards. Well, when you do that with a wide-angle lens like the Backscatter M52, what happens is you get a whole lot of sand. Like half your frame will be sand, um, and you won't have much background at all. So if you just take the camera, imagine this: you just tilt it back just a little bit. That will actually help with that and get it into uh, the camera in position so that the the Stingray is kind of more off the sand rather than shooting down into the sand. Gotcha. Awesome. And uh, I noticed that on the settings here, we're shooting one thirtieth of a second shutter speed. And I know that's because we're shooting on the TG5. But can you tell our viewers why? Because that's obviously a very slow shutter speed, especially for something moving this quickly. Yeah. And so um, there's a few reasons why the shot worked with the TG5. Number one, the TG5 uh, does not have full manual control on it. You only have uh, aperture priority and uh, program auto on it and full auto. So I always shoot an aperture priority because then at least I can pick the aperture. So for that, I pick F8 because I want to knock down the ambient lights so I can get um, so I can get the strobe to overtake the ambient light more. And usually, in general, uh, we're talking about um, – you know, one to two stops underexposed of what the camera would think would be a normal exposure for your ambient light is typically what you see in underwater photography. Um, for this one, I um, took it down uh, exposure compensation negative two stops uh, for it and kept it at ISO 100. That way it had a nice dark uh, background there. When you have the flash on on TG5, with the flash will default, um, have the shutter speed default to 1 30th of a second. Um, and it won't uh, go any faster than that unless the conditions allow it to go faster than that. Um, but in this case, because there's a lot of sand in here, and even though it's, I'm not in a complete overhead environment, there are there is like a crack above my head. It is darker shadow, but it's still pretty bright in there. And so that's why it's still defaulted to 1 30th of a second. Um, normally, for, for me, I would probably be having this up uh, at least to 1 25th, 
if not uh, 200 to 250 is where I would probably do this with a with a Stingray to um, to bring that shutter speed up. All right, got it. And we had some questions last week in the chat about avoiding backscatter and blown out images. And this image is straight up full of floating sand in the water column. So how'd you pull off such a clean shot? What's the secret? Well, the secret is in the stroke position. Well, actually, first secret is do no further harm. It's like, so by keeping my fins all the way up in the water column, and not stirring up the sand, I'm not going to have sand come from behind me and push into the scene. That's that's number one. Um, second thing is when you're set up for a shot like this, go ahead and um, and you need to position your strobes properly for it. So there's a few reasons for the strobe positioning on this um, on this particular shot. So imagine we have the camera housing, and we have our strobes. What the, what I do for this is I get the strobes straight up. Um, directly overhead uh, and out a little bit and angle them straight downwards at the sand okay. and basically lighting the stingray from the top like this. So there's a few reasons for that. Number one, whenever you have something where you have a stingray in the sand um, or anything that's in the sand, you need to get the strobes as far away from the sand as possible because the sand is the most reflective part of the entire image. So if you have the strobes down really low here, what's going to happen is you're going to nuke out the sand and then your object, which is, you know, a stingray, which is dark gray, which is much, much darker than the sand, is going to be underlit, and then the sand is going to be blown out, complete mess. So by taking the strobes and moving them up above the camera, you get the strobe as far away from the sand as you possibly can. The light will hit the stingray first, and then the sand. And so light falls off uh, the more distance it goes. So with the sand being further away from the stingray, it's just enough to have the sand um, be uh, lit properly, but still have the stingray lit properly as well. Nice. And as you saw this whole scene going down, again, with your approach and everything, how many shots did you really have to pull off before identifying this one as the keeper? Um, there, well, it's with, with the TG5, and, and it's not as fast as the SLR as far as um, uh, being able to shoot review and then shoot again really quickly. Um, so there's, there's not that many shots that I have of this one. There might be like three or four of this one. Um, but also I wanted to add in about the, uh, the minimizing the backscatter as well. Um, if we just touch on that about the strobes as well, is that when you look at this image, um, you see that there's sand being thrown everywhere by the stingray, but there's not a lot of backscatter. I mean, there's some, there's like, you see little, uh, pinpoints in the, in the back there, um, you kind of like around where the the grouper is. There's uh, there's uh, some uh, some things up there, and there's in the blue in in the little crevice back there. You, I can see some there, but when when I'm but in but overall, there's not a whole lot in there. And the reason for that is is I'm trying to not light the backscatter. So with the sand being kicked up all over the place, if I shoot straight on like this, the camera is looking this direction. The strobe is looking that direction. So the camera is looking at what the strobe is lighting up. So if I shoot this way, it's going to light up the scatter in the water, and the camera is going to be look at the scatter being all lit up. However, what, by doing this with the strobe and angling downwards, I'm now lighting the stingray this way. I'm lighting the particulate matter in the water this way. And so the camera is not looking that way, though. The camera is looking this way, so it's not looking at the particulate matter uh, that's being being lit from the front. It's looking at the shadow being cast by the strobe itself. So when you're going th shooting in this direction with the strobe, the camera is actually looking at the shadow rather than the part that's being lit. And that's how you eliminate the backscatter, or at least reduce it. You can't completely eliminate it in a situation like this, but you can greatly reduce the amount of backscatter in the image. I'd like to give a shout out to Jimmy White and Tim McClure in the chat who properly identified that strobe position as the ape hanger. Yes, that is called the ape hanger. There's a uh, in it's uh, if you go to wide angle boot camp or have been to the digital shootout, then you'll be able to tell that uh, I have a number of names for strobe positions that I use for different scenarios. Um, they're all kind of unique, interesting names that you can re remember when you're underwater. It's like, oh, I should use the ape hanger for this one. 
<laughs> right on, man. Hey, time is slipping by us here, so I want to jump onto the next image, if that's okay with you. This is kind of a, a fun, yep. a little more unusual one here. We've got a cool action scene, uh, a split shot over under, whatever you might call it. Let's take a look at this one and let us know what's going on here. This is pretty wild. Yeah, this is a different kind of uh, underwater shot. So I wanted to include this in there. It's it. There's no fish in the shot, so it's a little bit different. Everything I've done so far in these reviews has had some sort of fish in it or or um, or porpoise or something. Um, so this is um, this is a little bit unique shot. So in uh, in Little Cayman, they have a dock there. They bring the barge in, and um, it's a small island. So some of the guys there on the island they get a little bit bored. So. Um, they had a BMX bike and they built a, a bike ramp so they could launch themselves off this dock into the water. And so, um, so one day I was like, Hey guys, how about, um, how about, uh, we, uh, do this and I'll get in the water and I'll take some shots uh, of you guys doing it. And they're like, great. So I actually had, uh, this very rig right here, the D850. Um, I had a larger dome on it at the time, uh, cause I was doing split shots. Split shots are a lot easier with a, with a larger dome. And um, there's no strobes on this, so no no arms, um, no strobes on it, just the camera. Um, and so the way I pulled this off is, it's, and it had the the eight to fifteen uh, fish islands on it. So the way I pulled this off is, I got in the water and I would watch to see when they launched into the air and then got into the water where they were landing approximately. Because for me to pull the shot off, I need to be fairly close to them because of the fish islands. So I need to be. Um, probably within about uh, within three feet um, of of them when when they hit the water to make the shot uh, be able to be pulled off. Um, so I have to make sure they don't land on me as well. Um, there was a couple times when they uh, they look like they're going to land on me. They would like throw the bike in midair and I have some neat shots of the bike and them being completely apart from each other in midair. But um, so so that was a setup for the shot. So what happens is I used uh, on the Nikon, there's this thing called 3D tracking for focus. Mm -hmm. And it works really, really well. And so um, what I do is you put the square of the, the focus square onto the object you want to track. You press the AF on button. And as long as you have that button pressed down in AF continuous, it will track the object throughout the frame. And so it tracked them uh, coming down the boat ramp, hitting the ramp, up in the air, and then in the water, and even tracked them underwater. And so um, the, it, this is one of the reasons why I love shooting this camera is because with the 3D tracking, I just never have an out-of-focus shot. And so it, trans, it tracked the bike all the way to the transition underwater, which is a huge focus transition because when you're in air and you change to water, what happens is the is – the, um, that change, the distance becomes a lot closer to an actual real distance when you have the dome underwater. So there's a huge focus shift, and it still tracked it and tracked the the the, the bike rider underwater, which I thought was was insane. Yeah, um, that's nuts. Um, so, <laughs> how many times did that dude have to take the bike off the ramp and then drag the bike back out of the ocean again before you knew yeah. you had a keeper? <laughs> Yeah, we had we had like um, two or three guys doing this. This one was Nick. Um, Nick was um, he was the one that was kind of uh, spearheading the whole mission here. And so, yeah, Nick was uh, doing most of the work. He was getting kind of tired. But um, I I probably shot off probably around two to three thousand shots um, because I was using the motor drive on this. And uh, the camera will do about, you know, uh, seven or eight frames a second, something like that, which ideally you really want something like maybe like 10 to 12 frames a second or faster um, for this. So we did have to do it more often to get to get the shot. Um, so something that shot a little bit faster would be would be better. Um, but yeah, that's but it was it, we probably did it about an hour, to an hour and a half of this um, to come up with this. I think this was the best shot out of all of them where you have the split where you can see him in and out of the water. Um, you can see the, the bike rider underwater, the way that the wave hit, the way that you still have the people on the dock looking in the splash. I think all that looks looks pretty cool together. Yeah, it's really cool. Really, all the elements coming together to make the ultimate pick there. That's pretty rad. And I noticed your ISO is a little higher than we usually shoot. What was going on there? Yeah, so for this one, I didn't shoot pure manual on this. Um, I, it was in manual exposure mode, but then I used auto ISO for this because I don't have to worry about the strobe exposure. Um, and I think the camera will do a pretty decent job of getting exposure right um, on its own in this kind of a situation where it's only ambient light. 
So for this one, um, I actually set F8 and um, because I had the big dome. Normally for splits, I'm usually more like towards F22 because I want to get the corners really sharp, but I knew the corners weren't going to be an issue for this particular type of shot. Um, and then the other is that uh, the shutter speed at one, is at 1 uh, 12 50th. That is so I can get some frozen water drops. I can freeze the action of the um, of the bike rider in the um, in the image. And so I, I, I picked those two because um, and then the, the camera picked the ISO of uh, 400. I usually do exposure compensation down uh, negative one one third to two thirds on this um, on doing that to make it so I preserve the highlights. Um, but yeah, that's why the ISO is where it's at. The camera's actually picked the ISO. Um, and I didn't want to go higher on the f-stop because I knew that was just going to jack up the ISO more and, and just add more noise to the image. All right. So, awesome. Yeah. So that's, that's how, that's how I pulled that off. Nice. Very cool. Anything else you want to share about this one or shall we move on? Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's about it for this one. It's just, um, it's, you just gotta uh, keep going at it and you're not going to know that you have it until you get it back on the computer. Cause there's no way you can go through a couple thousand shots in camera. And that's why I wanted to spend an hour to hour and a half there trying to get this done. Cause there's so many times these type of shots, you'll never know until you actually look in the computer. And that's why you just keep doing it and do it and doing it. Truer words have never been spoken. That's it. <laughs> So we're moving on to one of my personal favorite shots of ours. This is a, an amazing cuttlefish shot. Let's uh, let's take a look at this one. Tell me a little bit about this guy and how, for, how'd you pull this shot off? How, how big is he? Looks like he's huge. Well, there's a few things going on with this. This uh, uh, cuttlefish is in uh, Wakatobi, uh, dive resort in Indonesia. Uh, so this is on one of their... Um, nice signature dives there. And, um, I came across this cuttlefish kind of in the shallows, um, you know, shallow meaning like maybe 30 feet or so. Um, there are some deeper sections of reefs there, but this is probably about 30 feet or so. And so, uh, with this, um, you know, the cuttlefish is hanging out and kind of not taken off. So, and it was, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly good sized cuttlefish. It's probably about that big. Um, so it's a fairly decent sized cuttlefish, but still for, uh, for wide angle, this is shot with a, a 5D Mark IV um, uh, Canon with the eight to 15 lens. And so with that, um, I, I, to make this look big in the frame, I need to get super close. Uh, with wide angle lenses, there's something called perspective distortion, where things that are closer to the camera lens will appear larger than things in the background. And so that's a trick you can do with um, fisheye lenses underwater to make smaller things look bigger is by getting super close to them. What I mean by super close, this guy is like fist distance um, or closer. Maybe could be two fingers to fist distance uh, away is, is about how far away the cuttlefish is. Almost um, touching to that the, dome. To the camera. Almost touching the dome, pretty close to it. Um, and so uh, that's how I get this perspective distortion is by having the subject that close to it. That's awesome. And so tell me about trying to balance exposure for this image, trying to get that sunball in the background and have him so evenly lit super close in the foreground. Yeah. So, so first a few things on the exposure settings, what I did with this is, um, I knew, um, that with, a with the, um, close focus wide angle stuff and being that close, I know I need to have my aperture, you know, cranked down pretty good. So I went to F22 on that right away, just so I get mo as much depth of field on the cuttlefish as possible. So I went to F22 on that. Um, then on the, uh, I, I knew I wanted to have another element in there and there's a beautiful sunball. And so I, I, so with the sunball, I was like, okay, well, what I need to do is get my, um, my shutter speed to the sync speed limit of what the camera will do to pull in the exposure of the sunball. And so then that was, uh, for a 5D Mark IV, that's one two hundredth of a second is as fast as you can shoot uh, with flash with that particular camera. Then after that, it was down the ISO. And so the ISO, I set that to 160, got a pretty decent background at that point. Um, and then I added in the strobes. Now the strobes, I was using these ones right here, the YS250s. Um, it's a little easier to demonstrate on, on this camera, but basically, I had the strobes in super tight, like crunched up against the handles here, just okay. like, just like this, um, in as tight as I could. Uh, and I had a, I had this dome on here, which is a small dome. Um, so I could get in super tight to the subject. And so that's how I got the strobe positioning in. 
Okay. And what you do is you just take a take a shot or two, take a look at it, and then you'll see where the um, see what the what the strobes need to be adjusted to. Because I know I want to have this cuttlefish about this close to the front of the dome, so the distance isn't going to change. So I don't need TTL for this. I don't think TTL is going to work really well anyway because the sun is going to be um, playing into the into the scene a lot. So that whenever you have like a really hugely backlit scene like this, the camera sometimes uh, can't figure out what to do with CTL for, for a scene like that. So I just shoot manual with that because I knew my distance isn't going to be changing. As soon as I get that dialed and it looks right, then I'm good to go. Gotcha. Other thing with shooting this is that I was, um, this is what's called a blind shot. Because if you look, the, the cuttlefish is down really, really low to the coral. So low so that I can't get in the position and still look through the viewfinder to make the shot uh, uh, and to pull it off. So what I did was I just take the camera and I put it down and angle it backwards. And then I can't see the screen. I can't see the viewfinder. I kind of aim it. I take a shot and then I'll look at it. And then when I look at it, I can see, okay, well, it's not, co not the composition I want. I need to slide the camera over this way or this way or tilt the camera more. And then I do it again. And when I take those shots, I pay attention to the position that I put the camera in. And then I look at the result. And then when I make a change, I look at the result again to see if that the, uh, the, the camera is getting into the right position. So I do that repeatedly until I can see that it's in the right position. So then when it's in the right position, what I'll do just to make sure I'll take the camera and I'll just move it a little bit and while I'm firing, just in case I guessed wrong. And then I have, I know some are going to be right. Some are going to be wrong but I'll have a greater chance of having more, uh, by having more shots at slightly different angles to, to be able to pull off a blind shot like that. The old spray and pray technique, huh? Yeah, it wasn't so upright, quite spray. It was, uh, it wasn't continuous shooting. It was, um, it was definitely, I'm, I'm waiting for the strobes to recycle, but these things were down at quarter power cause I was so close to the subject and at quarter power, these can, can go pop, 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 pop. And so I might do five or six shots, take a look, and do five or six shots more, take a look. Uh, I wouldn't chimp on every single shot because then you're just wasting time. Yeah, for sure. And do you have to do much work on this one in post? I mean, sometimes that you know, firing blind, it can be a little tough to nail in camera. What? Any any heavy editing have to go into this one? No, not really. It was um, it was a it was a tad bit dark um, when I had um, uh, in camera, so I did brighten it up a little bit in post for that. Um, so that's, that's pretty much all that I had to do in post is brighten it up. And yeah, I had a lots of shots to pick from. The, the reason I picked this one was because the sun ball was kind of just right overhead. It was, it was close to being center of, of, of like over the eye of the, uh, of the cuttlefish. The other thing is like the tentacles of the cuttlefish. I liked how that was on the dark background. So they really stood out. I had other pictures where the, the tentacles were kind of over the reef and the reef and the tentacles were kind of the same color. Because the, the to be honest, it's like the cuttlefish is designed to blend into its soundings. They change color, so um, so the idea is to like light the cuttlefish in such a way that it stands out from its background. And so having those tentacles over the blue water actually leads to um, a much more interesting photo because something that's designed to blend actually stands out really well. Yeah, no doubt. They look like they're about ready to reach out of the frame and grab us here. I love it. It's an awesome shot. Uh, I think let's kick it over to our final image because we want to leave enough time to get everybody's questions in there. So we're going to switch into macro mode here and take a look at a stylish backlit nudibrank. What do we got going on here from the A7R4? Yeah, um, this is um, this is the Sony A7R4. I shot this in uh, September of last year. Um, at uh, Alambatu in uh, in Bali. So hi to those guys out there, Danny and the crew. Um, and so this was uh, shot also with the um, the backscatter mini flash here uh, with a snoot. And so what we did, what I did here is um, the nudibranch was kind of um, on like a on perched up on top of a rock. And it, if you ever seen nudibranchs, they they kind of look around. Well, they don't really look, but they kind of feel around, and then and then before they go. Um, before they start going down the rock. Well, this is kind of like almost like a cliff. And so there is no place for it to go down. So it was constantly 
had had its butt on the rock and then would like kind of move around like this, trying to see or not see, but feel where to go next. And so it was just, so it was up high enough that I could get nice and down low and get kind of underneath it a little bit. And it would just take its head and move its head back and forth. And so that's how, that was the setup for the nudibranch. Um, the, um, the color background what that is, is actually, let me uh, grab that. I have it over here. Here's, this is a real secret of the pros here, guys. We're going deep now. Yeah, yeah I, can't, I can't claim that I invented this. Uh, Dharma at the, uh, at the resort there, he, um, he had this there, and let me borrow this. This is a kitchen sponge. Just like it's steel wool, sponge. right? Yeah, not quite steel wool, but like a stainless steel kitchen sponge. Oh, yeah, right, yeah, uh, like a little yeah, scrubber. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah it's like a little scrubby sponge. So this, um, I put on a muck stick and I stuck the muck stick in the sand behind the, um, the nudibranch. And then I took, um, the mini flash. We actually, um, coming out soon, we'll have, uh, color filters for the mini flash. And so I was testing the prototype mini flash with prototype color filters there. And I used the color filter to, um, on the strobe itself to then hit this in the background. And with, um, if you get this far away enough from your subject, because remember depth of field, the closer something is together, the 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 um, the less de the more depth of field you have, the further away it is, the less depth of field you'll have. So I put this as far in the background as I could, and then I had the um, uh, the the red the red filter on the strobe, and then in order to get the the bokeh uh, bubbles, because that's basically the reflection of the red off of this, you know, I went down the f7 one to make the bokeh bigger on those, on those bokeh bubbles in the background. Um, if I shot F-22s, these would be um, much um, tighter circles, much smaller circles and more numerous of them. Uh, but I wanted um, to have uh, bigger uh, bokeh bubbles in the background. And I chose the red because it kind of contrasted or, or kind of complemented the, the nudibranch with the, with the orange rhinophores on there. Um, and so the challenge was to get all that lined up, have the nudibranch in position, and with F7-1, making sure both rhinophores and nudibranch were both in focus was definitely a difficult task um, because it's a, it's a razor-thin depth of field at that point uh, in trying to pull off the shot. Yeah, you're definitely right on the like the knife edge of what is in focus and what's not there. I, I think this is really cool. We we use this one in a lot of our marketing, especially for the mini flash and stuff, because that, that super bubbly, bright background really is fun. And that is, you know, something that to just the viewer's eye, you know, you're going to know that probably didn't naturally occur, but it's so out of focus and extreme, you just can't, you know, you can't tell what it is. It's really cool. Um, yeah, one, so it's like. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say with the with the snoot, I'm coming like right over the top with this and lighting the head of the um, of the nudibranch. I wanted to see if I could just light the head and nothing else. Mm -hmm. um, how why you see the rest of the body in the image um, in shadow is the reflection from the red behind it uh, coming up and uh, and kind of filling that in a little bit. So it was the it was the the snoot on the front to give it a little bit of color on the on the head of the nudibranch, like the like the head and the rhinophores. And then, and then I had a separate strobe that was didn't have a snoot on it, but had a color filter on it, just laying in the sand, um, and then lighting the sponge behind it. Now it's like a lot of people will do, um, you know, right now they use a like a, a, a filter on a colored torch uh, for like the background light, and that's a lot harder to pull off. You can still do it, but. The thing is, with a torch, it's su subject to shutter speed, and so it's kind of mixed in with the ambient light. You know, luckily. Um, for us, we were down uh, probably about 90, 100 feet with this guy in in the black sands of Bali. It's not really reflective off off the bottom too much because of the black sand, and it's muck diving, so the visibility isn't great. So the vis so it's kind of dark down there, and it was also in the afternoon. Um, so that's why I was able to do an F7-1 at 250th and still have like a black background with this type of shot. But if you used a torch, you're going to have to increase the, either the, um, the ISO or slow your shutter speed down in order to let more light in from the torch. And then you're going to be fighting the ambient light along with the torch light um, and still trying to uh, play with the strobe. But if it, you do all strobe light for your background colors, it takes that out completely. You can just completely independently adjust the, the color exposure 
separately from your foreground exposure, separately from the ambient light. It uh, makes it a lot easier to pull off. Gotcha. Very cool. Um, is there anything else you'd like to break down about this shot, or are we about ready to jump into our Q&A? Uh, I think that's about it on this one. We can uh, go ahead and uh, hit the Q&A. All right. So let's see. I'm going to kick it back over to you for a second here. Our first question comes from, and I apologize if I mispronounce anybody's name here, uh, Jun Hyung Lim. Um, he says he just recently purchased one of the Sony RX 100s, uh, specifically the Mark V. He's got a pair of CNC YS03 strobes. He's also got two uh, about 4200 lumen output lights. Um, he says he's used to shooting some underwater pictures with an older Nikon camera, but this is his first time jumping into a new, you know, current like compact camera. Um, so he wants to know some basic settings for camera setup, like set an ISO and white balance. Um, obviously, there's a lot to this question, but Jim, can you maybe give him some starter advice there on where he might want to get those camera settings punched in? Right. So as far as white balance is concerned, if you're doing photo. Um, set it to auto white balance and also um, set to raw because white balance is metadata when you're shooting in raw. It's not permanently written to the file. You can change that in post non-destructively. So always shoot in auto white balance. It gets it right probably 90% of the time for when you're using strobes. Um, so just do do that and shoot raw and you'll be able to ch uh, change that in Lightroom in, the, in post if, if need be. Now, as far as settings, as far as uh, shooting... Uh, I always shoot manual. Um, and uh, when you say, well, what settings should I use, like shutter speed and aperture? Well, it's going to depend upon the scene. Um, it's going to depend upon the subject. So what I like to do for um, shutter speed and aperture, I pick them to be uh, what is appropriate for the subject. So if it's a faster moving subject, I'll use a faster shutter speed. If, it's, um, if I need more depth of field for like wide angle, um, then I will shoot a higher um, um, higher aperture to make sure that my wide angle uh, attachment lens is looking pretty good. For macro, I'm going to uh, wind up shooting um, usually uh, more closed down apertures to get more depth of field for my macro critters. So um, in general for that camera, it's only gonna go to F11 at the max. So I think you're gonna find yourself between F8 and F11 most of the time for your aperture. Your shutter speed can be anywhere from a 60th all the way up to 2000th depending upon what you're going, what your scene is um, and what you want to do with your background, how dark it's going to be. And your ISO is probably going to be in the range of 100 to 400, maybe 800 at the at an extreme. Mm -hmm. But it's all going to be dependent upon what you're shooting. And again, this I said this last week, the scene doesn't care what camera you have. It's not going to make a difference um, for uh, RX100 versus a Nikon. It's like those things will not change. Um, the scene needs to be seen, uh, lit the, in, and um, the settings need to be set for what the scene is, not per the camera. And that's a huge part of why we're doing these videos, too, is just to kind of put some of our favorite ones out there and see what sort of settings we applied to capture them, because they will be different to every scene. So experiment and, you know, check back here for a little bit more feedback, too. Um, we're going to move on to the next one here. Uh, Jeff Mark asks uh, about... In regards to the turtle shot, we had that first one that was shown with the Tokina 10-17 to lens. He's asking about an equivalent lens for a Sony E-mount camera. So how could he rock something like a Tokina 10-17 to on a Sony E-mount? Yeah, it's like I don't know if he means full frame or um, or crop sensor Sony E-mount. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer both of those since mm -hmm. other people might be watching and be curious as well. Um, as far as like on like the 6000 series from Sony – I have shot the uh, Tokina 1017 on those. So basically you get a Metabones adapter or the Photodiax has one, Sigma has one as well. What is this, the mount converter from Canon E-mount to Sony uh, mount. And so with the um, uh, Canon 1017, you can put that straight on to uh, a Sony crop sensor and you use that lens, works great, looks fantastic. Definitely my favorite lens to shoot on on those uh, systems. I like the, the the usability of the 10 to 17 range. Um, when you go to full frame, you can also use a Sony E mount or, or the, the 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 Canon to Sony mount converter again on that on the full frame cameras. However, I would recommend going to a a uh, um, a uh, Canon 8 to 15 lens. 
and so if uh, that gives you basically the, a full frame of uh, version of the Canon lens onto the Sony. Now, it, what some people do with the full frame cameras and the 8 to 15 lenses, this is uh, on Sony, Nikon, Canon. What you can do is you can use a teleconverter. So if you have a 1.4 teleconverter, that will kind of get you into the range of what a 10 to 17 can accomplish. Um, you're going to have um, about uh, about 10 to 15 is where it's going to wind up. You're not going to be able to have as much zoom range. And 8 and 9, you're going to have partial vignetting. But from about 10 to 15, you'll have a little bit more of a zoom range. Um, so it will allow you to do get a little bit tighter of a fisheye shot than just being stuck at the um, – at the uh, 180 degree fisheye part of it. You'll probably be able to knock that down to 120, 130 degrees. Awesome. Well, there we go. That is the answer. Hey, I just want to interject really quickly here. We are starting to see a few more questions roll in. And as our time remaining kind of runs out, uh, we want to get to as many of these as possible. So if we don't have time to answer your question, or if you're just watching this in the future after the live session has ended, please email us your questions. Uh, you can send them to sales at backscatter.com. Uh, that's going to reach you know quite a few of us here. We'll make sure that we get some eyes on that and get your question answered in a future stream. Um, but just moving on a little bit here, uh, Kayvon Malik was asking about the turtle shot as well. Were you shooting in continuous focus or in just single focus? Did you, did you have time to even maybe manually focus? What was the focus technique for a subject coming in straight at you on the dome like that? All right. So, uh, there's a few questions in there. So it's, that's, I'm glad you asked that. Um, and hope to see you again soon, Kayvon. <laughs> um, and so, what I um, what I do with, when I have the Nikon cameras, the the D500 and the D850, I am shooting 3D tracking the whole time. 3D tracking is in autofocus continuous. And so, um, what I do is I look at. Um, I always have to pick my focus point. My focus point is going to be the nearest thing in the frame. So, the nearest thing in the frame for that turtle shot is the nose or the mouth. And so I put the focus uh, point on there and I hold down the AF on button continuously and it's continuously updating focus the entire time while I'm firing. I, I think with the D850 and D500, there's no reason to shoot another way in underwater photography with these cameras to have the focus tracking like that. Yeah, if it's that good, you might as well use it, you know? Yeah, it's like I never have the, those cameras now. I never have an out of focus shot ever. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for answering that one for us here. Let's see. Um, I think this one was actually addressed in the chat, but we can touch on it quickly here. Tim McClure was asking about your uh, SLR rig on the table there and your rope lanyard attached. Um, he's, he was asking if that's something that you just rigged up yourself or if that's something we sell. I already know the answer to that, but see if you can throw a little info out there. Yeah, this is um, this is a lanyard from uh, Nauticam that they make. Um, you know, Aquatica makes one that's really nice. Um, Ultralight makes one as well. Um, but basically, I uh, have this hooked up here so I can take this rig and um, and just sling it over my shoulder to walk it to the boat. Because um, to be honest with you, you know the SLR rigs, while on land they can be a bit heavy to carry, but mm -hmm. slinging it over your shoulder makes it pretty easy. But once you get this thing in the water, up the floats and everything, it's it's neutrally buoyant, really easy. Do you unhook that once you're in the water? Yeah, what I do is I unhook it because otherwise I can't move my strobes arm. They're going to be stuck. So I'll take this and I'll clip this off to my BC. I also have another um, lanyard on this that's attached to the left side. And this is uh, on a coil. And so I can take the coil and undo it. So then this can stretch as far away as I want. But the, the rig is still attached to me because this part's still attached to my BC here. So I have that. So the rig is uh, always attached to me um, and it makes it really easy. I like it on the left side because the right hand is super busy, uh, like focusing, firing, shutter speed aperture. And the left hand isn't as busy, so it's not in the way that much. That's why I like to have my um, my BC lanyard on the left hand side. I like to say that adding one of those coil lanyards to your system is probably the least expensive accessory you're going to put on your housing. And it's one of the most helpful because you don't have to decide between saving your camera rig or your buddy if you have an emergency. You can save both. 
Yeah, or or if with when you like a photographer, a lot of time you look around. You're in Indonesia on a drift dive. Nobody else is around. You got to pop a bag, you know, uh, to go to the surface. Um, you know, deploy an SMB, mm-hmm. and so uh, that's kind of hard to do while you're trying to hold on the camera. So what I do is I just clip this thing off, put it underneath my uh, my shoulder over here, send the bag up to the surface, and then start doing my ascent. There you go. Safety first, hands free. Um, hey, our friend Jenny was asking about that bike split shot. She was wondering if you were going to use strobes, how would that affect that recipe? You know, what what would the right setting be? Obviously, our rate of fire would go way down. How would you pull that off if you were going to shoot with some light? Um, I wouldn't. Um, for that type of shot, it's just not going to happen. You'll be there for three days and you still might not get it. Because the whole thing with that shot is that you need to be able to um, – fire off rapidly you need to be doing like i said it's like 10 to 12 frames a second is kind of more where you need to be um and so strobes just aren't going to keep up with something like that um Mm -hmm. it's going to be really hard and uh and it just adds a whole nother level of complexity because when when these guys were um landing in the water they were they weren't always landing in the same spot so i would i would be backed off a little bit um and then when uh, when I could see when they were in the air, like, oh, they're going to land in that spot. I could tell where they're going to actually land. I would then push into the image. And so they're trying to you know, get the strobes in position for that. Um, it's going to light up a lot of the, um, the bubbles that are in the water, that, which are going to be like, re- like really white and distracting. So I don't think the, that, the strobes are really going to work for that. One thing you didn't ask me about that shot was about the post-processing. Oh yeah, sure. And so and so there is there is a bit of post processing in that one because that was pretty late in the day. That was about five o'clock because I had to wait for these guys to get off work. Um, and so it was about five o'clock. So the sun's really low on the horizon, and when it's low on the horizon, more of the sun rays bounce off the surface than actually penetrate. So it's while it might be bright on the surface at five o'clock, it's pretty dark underwater. And so um, on this right out of the camera, the exposure was pretty dark right out of the camera. And so what I had to do was uh, use a graduated filter in Lightroom and uh, and it dragged that up from the bottom and then uh, use exposure to brighten it. Now with the D850 at ISO 400, there's tons of dynamic range with this camera. And so all the shadow detail was there, it was just really dark. So I just brightened the shadow detail on the underside of the image to then pull that out of it. So I think strobes would be, um, would be a complication to this that would um, just frustrate you and, um, and not make it happen, and just adds um, adds another element of um, of difficulty level to the point where you probably aren't going to get the shot. There you go. I think that's a solid answer. Um, Romina was asking, how do we set the white balance on a camera when shooting with strobes? And I know you kind of answered this in a previous one, but let's break it out here a little more. Yeah, and, and so basically, you're going to put it on auto white balance and shoot raw. Um, and with the strobes, you're going to be 90% of the time. It's going to be, it's going to be correct. Um, if there's something where it's not correct, it's not going to be that far off. Um, you can adjust that in Lightroom later, non-destructively if you're shooting raw. Um, there's, uh, I know that some people say, oh, well, for underwater, you should shoot cloudy or, or, or some or, or the one that has strobe or no, just shoot auto white balance. Um, and then, and it'll be fine. All right. Awesome. We had uh, another question from Regina Roberts here. She was asking about that turtle shot, the first one we looked at. And she mentioned that when you were aiming the strobes in, how did you maintain such even lighting? She says, you know, she would have thought there might have been kind of a hot burnout white spot in the mix there. How would you pull that off? Well, these are YS250s with diffusers on them. So they have a very nice wide even diffuse beam. So that's uh, number one on why uh, you don't see a hot spot. But even with a um, with a, a, a strobe that that didn't have as a smooth beam, the turtle is you know the front of the turtle is like you know this is the width of the frame it, you know it's like so it's not that much so when I ter- take the strobes and turn them inwards a little bit, um, there's not going to be like a hot spot because you know I, number one I have the diffusers on but even if you didn't have diffusers on it's still not going to be that much of a hot spot because um, the scene is just not that big. Um, so it's, 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 number one is like, I always shoot wide angle with diffusers on 
specifically for that reason to have nice wide even uh, beam coverage. The other reason why there's not a hot spot is I turn the strobe power down, mm -hmm. and so that way you get the proper exposure on the on the turtle. You don't need to hit it with a ton of light when it's like right there in front of you. That's when you'll start uh, blowing stuff out. So take that when they when things get tighter into the dome, you need to start turning the strobes down. If you're doing like a big scene, then you need to turn the strobes up. There we go. Um, I think this will probably be the last question we're able to get to today. Um, Roger Guzman asks, uh, he says, hey, I'm very new to the world of underwater photography. He started with a TG6 and he's ready to upgrade. What would we recommend? I know this is a little open ended, but kind of sets us up for a nice cliffhanger ending here. I, I know it's like and you already know the answer I'm going to say. <laughs> it's like I, it's like for me personally, I, I say the D850. Um, for a number of reasons, you're like, whoa, going from a TG6 to a D850. I actually had somebody on one of our wedding boot camps um, before, you know, we do a, a pre-trip questionnaire, and she had on there, she had a TG5, and then she shows up with a 1DX Mark II from Canon. It's like the top of the line Canon SLR. I was like, oh, I thought you were shooting TG6. So, oh, well, she said, well, if I'm gonna, I figured I needed to really upgrade to take the most, uh, get the most out of it. So I just decided to go to the top. And it's like, you definitely did. Um, but for like the D850, the um, reason I recommend that, number one, SLR in, in the first place, is that uh, because you're an optical viewfinder. The optical viewfinder makes it much easier to see wide angle scenes. If you remember with your TG, if you're trying to do like some uh, wide angle scenes and you have like the sun in the background, you can't see your foreground. It's completely in shadow. It's because uh, the, the camera can't handle that dynamic range. Well, if you look through the optical viewfinder, you can see everything clearly. That's number one. Another one, it like we talked about the focus on this thing. Um, that was the second thing on it. Uh, the image quality, um, the the, the uh, focus capability, the uh, speed of shooting as well. Um, the colors look fantastic. Um, but one thing overall that you're going to find with most SLRs compared to compacts is that it's so much easier to operate than a compact. With the TG6, um, as good as a camera as it is, it, it, you know, if you start doing some wide angle stuff, trying to get creative with things, it becomes a lot more difficult because you don't have full manual control on it. With full manual, I can say, okay, 200th of a second, uh, F8, boom, done. I have to, the TG6, I have to kind of fake it out and trick it to adjust the shutter speed on it. And I'm always fighting the camera. Um, you know, one thing is that, uh, you know, ISO shutter speed aperture, none of that changes. It depended upon what camera you're using. Just because this is a bigger camera, it's got more features in the menu and stuff, you don't use any of that underwater. You're going to do shutter speed, aperture, ISO, strobe, focus. That's what you're going to do. It doesn't matter what camera you're talking about. That's what you have at your disposal. And the SLRs are a hell of a lot easier to operate. There's a reason that I use this for my job if I need to go out and come home with stuff because it makes my job easier for me. If the TG6 made my job easier for me for everything I needed to shoot, then I would use that piece of gear. But for the, um, but for um, for me, this is the easiest piece of gear. It makes my life so much easier using this, comp even compared to let's say a mirrorless camera. Here we get into a little bit of um, debate here and um, an argument maybe. Um, but I still like looking through the optical viewfinder because of the backlit wide angle scenes. There are some other benefits to mirrorless when you're talking about macro and being able to review your image without having to move your face away from the viewfinder and look through the viewfinder. I still use the viewfinder on mirrorless cameras. I don't like using the screen because it's it can be hard to see in extreme high ambient light conditions. Um, but uh, but trust me, it's like I've had number, numerous conversations with people where they were thinking of you know going to another compact, and it's like you should go this way. They went to the other compact. A year later, they came back. They went and got the SLR. So mm -hmm. it it does it it does um, it does um, you know it might seem intimidating at first, but once you start breaking it down, it's really not that much different operation underwater. It's actually easier. And um, Robin and I had a really good debate um, last year on D850 versus A7R3, and there's a video up on um, our um, our video review about that. Mm -hmm. And um, and we did go a lot of the pros and cons of mirrorless versus SLR, which you could also kind of take that as compact versus SLR as well, um, because you're still composing off of the screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely some similarities there. 
Well, I think that about wraps up the amount of time we've got left in this broadcast. Uh, I want to say thanks to everybody for fielding us some awesome questions here. And that this is actually one of the first streams we've hosted where there were more questions than we could actually get to while keeping this to a reasonable broadcast length. So we'll either answer those in the comments um, if they haven't already been, or we'll follow up with you. We'll throw them into the next stream. We'll just, you know, basically keep those questions coming in. You can comment on this post long after the live video is actually ended you can send us emails directly we'll just keep pumping those out and you know answer more of your questions basically every tuesday at noon uh pacific time here so you know i just want to thank everybody for tuning in and watching this and contributing to you know this this uh this cool live q a thing we're trying out um, I want to say big thanks to Jim back in the studio for joining us from HQ. It's been another great afternoon uh, talking with you, Jim, and hopefully you guys all enjoyed these images. I did see, too, it looked like we had a couple more people watching than we've even had on our last stream. Seems like they're just getting more and more popular, so spread the word far and wide. If you enjoyed this, if you found these tips helpful, tell all your underwater photo friends or anybody that you might think just enjoys this little midday break. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's you know just another another fun way to connect with all of our viewers out there. So keep on watching, and we will be back next Tuesday, same place, same time. We should have a post up on Facebook about that shortly, so you can set that reminder and get notified. In the meantime, any other questions, anything you want to send to us, just feel free to reach out directly. We are working from home, but phone lines are open, emails are getting answered. Here we are. We're, you know, we're ready to talk with you and, and nerd out on some underwater camera systems. So I'm Robin from Backscatter signing off. Jim, you want to say bye as well? Yeah, I'm Jim signing off. And uh, we'll definitely get to those questions and get back to you guys on that stuff. For sure. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you next time.